Hello one and all, and welcome to a new series that will become irregular on this channel, The Absolute Mad Men, where we take a look at some of the most eccentric, crazy bastards in the history of mankind. Today we are looking at a man by the name of Horst de Verkohl. This gentleman lived from 1881 to 1936. The most famous portion of his life, however, was around the turn of the 20th century. Horace was a notable prankster in his day, and not some cheap Joey salads or foozy tube. He was... Well, go big or go home, to say the least. He was an undergraduate at Cambridge University and had a way of messing with authority and other posh people. He was proclaimed a dangerous man to his friends by the Home Secretary of the British Empire, none other than a young Winston Churchill. He was also the father to the author of Doctor Who. Some of his smaller pranks included inviting people to a party with Bottom in their last name and seeing what would happen, Paying bald men to sit in a crowd of a prestigious play, with letters spelling out obscenities in the perfect view of the rich people in the mezzanine, and more. Another notable prank was challenging a Minister of Parliament, Oliver Stillingfleet Locker Lampson, hell of a name, to a race in which the MP got a head start. Then after Horace slyly slipped a watch in his this man's pocket, started chasing after the man, saying, Stop! He stole my watch! Or something of the sort. So a police officer arrested the mil Minister of Parliament. You can see what kind of man we're getting here and what kind of wonderful people we're going to be looking at in this series. If you thought that was pushing the boundaries of pranks, we are just getting started with this wonderful gentleman. He concocted an idea for a big prank with his friend Adrian S Stephen. Originally in 1905, they had the idea of the trick troops of the German army to cross over the border into France with Adrian Harse posing as officers. I know, what could possibly go wrong? This idea was shot down, however, as another interesting opportunity had arised. The Sultan of Zanzibar, a British protectorate at the time, Ali bin Hamoud, was to make a visit to the UK, and gave the, and this gave them an idea. Impersonate the Sultan and make a fool out of the mayor, a local pharmacist of a lower class, this is Edwardian England, and other officials. They grabbed friends to join the party as a two-man envoy, is not very convincing, with one of their friends from Oxford, Cambridge's rival, as the European translator. The first snag was the local paper, as they had published the Sultan's photos, so now everyone knew what he looked like. The group reworked their plan as the Sultan's non-existent uncle, and ordered costumes and donned blackface. After sending a fake telegram to the mayor's office informing them of the pending visit, the plan was on. After taking a train from Liverpool to Cambridge, they met the mayor and were taken on a tour of a town, starting with a local market, well, they bought a bunch of junk to make it look like they were rich, as they would have to keep up the act. Once the tour of the town and colleges were complete, they headed back to the train station where they were to board a train to London, which they had not thought about. They did not think of their exit, they really only thought, hey, let's mess with them. So, they then ran away from the station to the countryside, what I can only imagine looked like a bunch of color people zoidberging away into the sunset. This caused a fuss around town, and the Daily Mail, yes, that Daily Mail, wrote an article about the African visitors who suddenly ran away and started speaking in perfect English, which caused a lot of papers to publish on the event. The group held a vote to see if they should go public, where everyone besides our madman decided that would be a bad idea. Of course, he did not care and did it anyway. And Adrian accompanied him, as he wanted to keep the facts straight, can't have him embellishing his own stories. The Daily Mail ate this up, and the mayor and the local authorities found out. They weren't exactly happy, the mayor was livid and wanted the students expelled, but no one else really saw it as a grave misdeed, and thought the mayor could just not take a joke. The vice chancellor of Cambridge at the time even told the mayor, For the sake of your own reputation, think it over. Classes in Old England were weird. They got off scot-free. Now, you might wonder, how could he ever talk the- Well, now that's what I call a segue. Alright, now for a history lesson. In the early 20th century, things were warming up politically in Europe. I wonder where that could lead. <laughs> Due to the standoff between the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance, please note that they mean the exact goddamn thing, 
The German Empire wanted to build a strong navy as their alliance was pinched between the members of the other, so ruling the waves, which I've heard is Britannia's thing, would allow them to hold their naval supply lines. Britain responded by building ships like the HMS Dreadnought, a whole new line ahead of many of those ships of the time. This connects to Horace as one of his friends who served on the HMS Hawk, notable for its sinking by the highly effective U-Boat 9, which is actually a pretty good idea for a video in the future if anybody's interested, gave Horace the idea to prank them in some way. Horace ate this up as the flagship of the British Navy would most likely have stuck-up snobby officers on it. Even better was the fact that Adrian was related to one of the officers on the said ship. They came up with a plot not too dissimilar from the previous, except with the new people pulled from the Bloomsbury group, as the old group had graduated, minus Horace because he didn't feel like it, and the rest didn't keep in contact as much. The plan was to go on a state trip to inspect this ship, dressed up as the fake prince of the Salmonic dynasty of Ethiopia, or Abyssinia, whatever you want to call it at the time. A minor note I found out is the fact that no one took notice of a foreign entity looking at the top top class state-of-the-art battleship was suspicious, especially in the years leading up to World War I. Adrian Horace would play interpreters, while the rest would play the Ethiopians, including the woman, Virginia, playing a man with a beard. Feminism, hell yeah. Horace had one of his friends send a telegram posing as the foreign affairs minister saying that the prince wants to see the ship and he'll be coming by taxi with two interpreters. They arrived with a celebrity's welcome, with an officer's escort, where they boarded a boat to take them to the moored ship. While on the ship, the Ethiopians spoke poor Swahili, you know, because all African countries look the same, and Latin at points, because what, el what else language do they know? No one noticed. Like when one of their mustaches fell off, or when the one Salman had referred to the translator as a German name, which would not go well during this time frame, as German spies were everywhere. They also used the phrase a bunga bunga to mean what a nice day, though this is disputed as it was the ol only the media to report it. As they were leaving, the sailors went to play the national anthem of Abyssinia and hoist their flag. While they didn't have either, they did play the national anthem of, get this, Zanzibar, and hoist their flag from the time the real sultan visited England. How's that for some irony? About a week later, the Royal Navy wised up to the fact that the prince didn't exist, and the media as well, as Horace had most likely tipped them off, if history is anything to show for it. The overall reaction to the hoax was quite different than to the Zanzibar prank, as the Navy was a higher class than your average pharmacist mayor. They even sparked a parliamentary debate over national security of the fleets, and the ability for saboteurs to infiltrate them. Now, while the pair did deceive the Navy, and the reaction was poor, they technically didn't break the law. The friend who sent the telegram, however, did commit a crime, but was never charged. This led to the Navy taking a personal approach to reprimanding them. They tracked down Adrian first, as he had the physical connection to the ship. He then apologized and gave the rest of the party's names. We do not know what happened to two of them, but Horace and Duncan, the latter of which was pulled from his home and thrown into a van and was caned in the countryside, not fun. But Duncan was polite, so they did not do it as hard as normal, it was more like a few whacks. Horace had fallen ill a few days previously and was taken as well, but asked to be able to fight back. They hit each other six times and called it even. The one woman, Virginia, was not punished as she was a woman, and that would be disrespectful. Hom hom, pompous pompous, Edwardian England. She did, however, go on to become the famous writer Virginia Woolf. Writing seemed to run in their blood, as after two of the conspirators died, Adrian wrote a book. For Horace, he went on to get into several unsuccessful marriages, and like many interesting people, he died an uninteresting death. Broken alone in France to a heart attack. So, everybody remembers that bunga bunga bit from earlier. It went on to be a way to mock African languages and was a popular phrase among Silvio Bersconi. Anybody remember bunga bunga parties? Anyway, despite its debate as to whether it actually happening or not, the phrase went on to become something to tease the Royal Navy with. This all comes back around when in 1915 the HMS Dreadnought rammed a German U-boat and sank it. Something you don't exactly see every day. There were many congratulatory messages and among them, were two words, bunga, bunga. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed. What do you charge to go all the way? Uh, 
100,000 yen? Perfect. You take care. Is that that John? You... That has to be that one. Shut up. EAT THE FUCKING PIZZA! ...of your parents who may or may not walk up to find you pulling a one-handed warrior during your lolly marathon. <laughs>